One of the reasons why I've been looking forward to this topic is because sometimes we think we know. In fact, some, most of the time we claim that we know. But over time, with, with the passage of time, you begin to realize and recognize maybe the things that I think I know, maybe I don't know them. Maybe the things that I've been defending all my life, maybe they're not what I think they are. And so today we're going to be looking at the topic, the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God. God is not mysterious. I know that sounds uh, somehow, but let me tell you from the onset, God is not mysterious. He is not hiding from any of us. In fact, more than anything, he wants us to know him in the trueness of who he is. Over the years, we've all heard about God. We've been told different things about God. Maybe you've even preached about God like I am doing today. But the truth is, there is there's a difference between knowing God and knowing about God. For instance, if you're a married person, when you were dating, when you were courting, there are certain things that you know about your, your, the person you are dating or courting. And if anybody asks you that time, do you know this person? You say, oh, yes, I know him completely. I can tell you everything about her. And then you get married. Then you start spending time together. Then you start living in the same house. Then you start everywhere you turn, there, there. Everywhere you look, there, there. And suddenly you start to see certain things that in some way make you wonder, I thought I know this person. But more than that, you start, you start to see certain things about yourself. And you're thinking, where did that come from? You see, one of the uniqueness of closeness, of, of being together, is that it reveals who you are to you. And it reveals who this other person is to you as well. The challenge will then be, what do you do with the knowledge that you have now? How do you, how do you manage this new discovery or revelation that suddenly is upon you. And I, and I believe that is where a lot of relationship, that is where they break down. As Christians, we are called the children of God. We are called by God. We, are, we, are, we have been adopted into his family. And one of, the, one of the benefits of that is we carry his name. We carry his emblem, we carry his label, we are branded with his logo or his identity as it were. But you see, when God called us, when God brought us into his family, it's not just for us to obey what his well, to obey his instruction. Now that's that is important. It is important for us to obey his instruction, but that is not just what God is looking for. God is looking for us to go beyond obeying to the point of doing. Obedience is important. Obedience. Somebody said obedience is the currency of favor. Obedience is important, but on the basis of our relationship with God as his children, a bigger emphasis is placed on the, the, the necessity, the requirement, the expectation of God for us to go beyond obeying him, but to do. Because sometimes what we call obedience is mental assent. What we call obedience is just because you said, okay, I hear you, I'll do it. Or what we call obedience is just because you, 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 you just heard of that conversation you want to put an end to it. Say, okay, that's fine. What we call obedience sometimes is because we have good intention. But you see, intention alone is not, it's not going to cut it. You have to take that intention beyond intention phase into actually doing it. 
But you see, as Christians, most of us, we, we spend our time, we spend our energy and everything trying to obey God. And it, it is good. In fact, the Bible tells us that it, to obey is better than sacrifice. Trying to obey God and, and don't do this and don't do that and you have to do this and you have to not say that, you have to. And all of that, we spend our energy working around that to the point that when it comes to the point of delivery, when it comes to the time of execution, when it comes to the place where we need to act, we've run out of steam. And because we are not doing what we claim to obey, what we claim to have received, what we claim to, to be his will, because we're not doing them, we're not seeing results. And so many, of, many Christians are living frustrated. Many Christians are wondering, what is it? I mean, I'm doing everything. Everything that I've obeyed this, I've gone to church on Sunday, I've fasted and on Wednesday, I've given my tithe, I've served in the ministry of Children are great as that may be. If all you're doing is obeying with mental assent, with heart intention, with the heart desire, and you are not doing it, you are exactly what James chapter 1 from verse 22 to 25 described. James chapter 1 from verse 22 to verse 25. It said, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straight away forget what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continue daring, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word. This man shall be blessed in his deeds. For years, for years, we've all been to church, gone to church, be in church, do church, and we are church ourselves. We've heard different sermons from a to Z, we've been through all the five steps to and all the three steps of not to, and we've done all of that. We've heard all of that rather. But when you look at your life and I look at my life, I'm asking the question, why am I not seeing the expected change or at least to the degree to which it should be happening right now in my life. And the bottom line is not, the, the issue is not whether you're hearing the sermon. The question is, are you doing? Because hearing the word will only give you information. But when you hear it and you process it and you understand what you have heard, that will then give you the fuel to apply because it is in the application that the result will come. You hear the word, you study the word, you meditate on the word, you understand the word, then you start to act on the word. When you start acting, the result will come. In fact, as great as obedience is, Obedience is not obedience until you do something about what you said you obey. So really, action is the first step, is the demonstration of what you say you obey. The depth of your knowledge of who God is will encourage you to find out what he has said about you concerning your life, concerning your family, concerning your health, concerning your career, concerning the world at large, that knowledge will, will, will inject you with a superpower that will force you to do something about it. The knowledge of who God is will boost your trust in him and in believing him and believing in his promises and believing in his covenant, that knowledge of him will bring you to a point where you, you trust him. And because you trust him, the natural 
follow up from that is to do. One of the reasons many of us are still not doing what we have heard concerning God and his kingdom, one of the reasons we're not doing anything about it is because some of us are still not sure about his person, about who God is really. We've heard about a lot of things about him, but who is he? What is he? How is he? Where is he? When is he? And we still have somewhere in the deepest part of our hearts, there's still that niggling question. But when you trust him, when you know him rather, that knowledge will, will build a level of trust in you to the point that you, you just do. Look at what Apostle Paul said. When, as far as he's concerned, the knowledge of God, getting to know who God is, understanding who God is, not, not about what he's going to do and what he has done and what I'm praying for and I'm believing for, not about my shopping list to God, no. Him as, as God. In Philippians chapter 3, from verse 7 to verse 10, Philippians chapter 3, from verse 7 to verse 10, Apostle Paul said, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yet, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but done. Why? Why would you count everything you've achieved, all your, your, uh, your, your degree, your knowledge, your expertise, your position, why would you suddenly pack them up in a box and label it dung so that you can gain the knowledge of Christ, so that you can know who God is, so that you can be hold of it? Why would you do that for support? He said this that I may win Christ. It's not talking of so that I can become born again. It's not talking about so that I can have a title in the church. No, it said for one reason and one reason alone, that I may win Christ. And win him so much that I'll be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made comfortable unto his death. I mean, this Apostle Paul that is talking about wanting to know God, this is the same Apostle Paul when he was saw that God appeared to on his road to Damascus. That God directed to go somewhere so that somebody can pray for him and for his eyes to be open. This is the same Apostle Paul that has gone around the, the then known world and, and turned their table upside down with his knowledge of God and his Christ. And yet here he is writing to the, the church in, Philipp in Philippa and saying, one thing I, the, 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 the ultimate for me is that I may know him. How, of, how much of God do you know? How much of God do I know? Do we know him or do we know about him? Because it doesn't matter what you think you have. It has no bearing on it what degree and how much PhD and DDD and LLB and HND and whatever it's the after your name. It matters not until those things are placed on a scale against your knowledge of God and they are found wanting. You don't know God. Until everything you know in comparison to your knowledge of God, it's 
Because when you know him and you understand his plans and you understand his purpose, not just for you, for your life, but for his kingdom and your place within the scope of that kingdom responsibility, you will suddenly realize like Apostle Paul came, came to, his, to himself and said, everything else is done. Everything else push aside. Everything else have no bearing. Unfortunately for many of us, Christians, children of God, unfortunately, many of us believe that because we go to church on Sunday, and because we, we, we listen to the sermon, because we sing in the choir, because I'm the head of the uh, board of whatever, because I carry this title, because I'm the preacher, because I'm the founder, because I'm, we think that means we know him. No, we don't. We think we know him. We know about him. We've heard about him. But do we know him? It is this half-baked knowledge, this half-baked knowledge or no knowledge of who God is. That is why many Christians and many people end up being led astray by one doctrine that is fashioned out of something that has no bearing with God, or they take a, 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 an an a, an incident in the story, and they make that into a culture, into a tradition, and everybody thinks that is who God is. Unfortunately, in that situation, what many people will end up with is a counterfeit knowledge. It's an, an incomplete and an adulterated knowledge of God because they will have the semblance of God, but they will have no real power that comes from God. The knowledge of God, the understanding of God, how much of God you know and you comprehend, how much of him you keep searching for, you keep pursuing, you keep looking for you, you are hungry and thirsty for. How, the more you thirst after him, the more you hunger after him, for him, for, to know him, not about what he's going to do or how he's going to pay your bills. There's nothing wrong with all of that, but I'm talking of just knowing him. In fact, Jesus Christ, when he was praying for his disciples, concerning eternal life was saying, everything else is not eternal life. Nothing else equates to eternal life outside the knowledge of God. There is nothing more powerful. There is nothing that has greater effect in a man's life that is greater or bigger than his knowledge or her knowledge of God. Because that knowledge of God, it will, it will embolden you. It will strengthen you. It will infuse you with, 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 with the boldness of a lion that you will dare the undareable. You will go the extra mile. You will do whatever it takes because you know this is not about you. This is God himself. This is the same reason David, a teenager, who stand before Goliath of Gath. This is Goliath that, is the, that, that the whole army of Israel were hiding from. But David stood in front of, the, of him and said, what, you? Oh, you? You're dead me today. Why? The knowledge of the God that's behind it. Jesus said to his disciples, and by extension to you and I today, that there is nothing greater than knowing God. The true meaning of eternal life is your knowledge of God. According to the gospel of John chapter 17 from verse 2 to verse 3. John 17, 2 to 3. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, 
that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. This is Jesus Christ praying to God. And he said, as God had given him, given Jesus the power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as that, has, that God has given to him. And then he said this. And this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Now, to an average Christian, if you ask what is eternal life, they said, give your life to Christ, and you will live forever in heaven. And if you don't give your life to Christ, if you don't ask Christ to come into your life, you will go to hell, and you will live your, the rest of your live eternity in the lake of fire. So that's the eternal life. That's destination. Eternal life, as explained here, as described here, as, as, as revealed to all of us here, by Jesus Christ himself, the begotten son of God, he said eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. It is the knowledge of God that is eternal life. The knowledge of God. The knowledge of God. That's what eternal life is. No wonder Apostle Paul was willing, was ready, was completely sold out to bid everything and throw everything that he has accomplished over the years. He was ready to cast them away because nothing greater than knowing God, than seeking him, than finding him, than understanding him. In the book of Jeremiah, Chapter 9 from verse 23 to verse 24. Because sometimes, as human beings, we believe we have achieved something. We believe we have earned a, a level, a status. We believe we have become self-made or whatever made. And we put our boast in that. We, we make that. We, that becomes the chip on our shoulder, for lack of better term. But look at what Jeremiah was saying here. In Jeremiah chapter 9 from verse 23 to 24, I'm reading from the Amplified Bible because I want this to be, to be very clear. Jeremiah chapter 9 from verse 23 to 24, he said, Thus says the Lord, let not the one who is wise and skillful boast in his insight. Let not the one who is mighty and powerful boast in his strength. Let not the one who is rich boast in his temporal satisfaction and earthly abundance. But let the one who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me and acknowledges me and honors me as God and recognizes without any doubt that I am the Lord who practices loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For in this thing I delight, says the Lord. Yes, you have all the money to go to the moon and back. Yes, you are the professor that teaches every other professor. Yes, you are the, 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 you are the scientists that discover how, how the atom and the molecules and all, the, all of them combine together. Maybe you are the president and chairman and chief executive of the World Bank. Whatever it is you think you have, you have become that is that has shaped you and, and, and put you in a, in, on a pedestal. And now you are boasting about that. 
God is saying, they, they don't, they just rubbish. The only place where you can boast, the only thing that you can boast about is your knowledge of God and his Christ. Even God said, it is in that that he is delighted. If you want to see, if you want to experience, if you want to enjoy the delight of God, focus your attention. Focus your energy, focus your life in finding more about him because you can't, you can't get to the bottom of your knowledge of God because every day, every time, everywhere you look, there's a new thing, there's a new discovery, there's a new show of his hand, there's a new grace of his majesty, there's something new about God that you cannot get to the end of your knowledge of him. He said, when you sit that with all of your heart, when you seek him with all of your heart, you will find him. Now, let me clarify this. There is a place for praising God, for worshiping God. But his greatest delight is in your knowledge, in seeking the knowledge of him. Because as you seek him, as you pursue him, as you draw closer to him, he reveals himself more and more and more and more. Imagine Moses, who's been to the mountain, who's spoken to God, who is heard from God, who is done this and done that and, and everything, and then suddenly he said to God, show me who you are. What do you mean, show me who you are? We've been on the mountain together. So much of when you came down, the children of Israel couldn't look at your face. You've heard my audible voice. What, what do you mean? No, it is that heart desire, that cry in your heart of who God is. And as you pursue him, as you dig deeper, as you look for his knowledge, he reveals things to you. Not because he was hiding them before. No, it's because they were there all along. You just need to dig a little bit. You need to dig a little bit. You need to dig a little bit, and then you find the gold. You dig a little bit, and then you find the diamond. You dig a little bit, and then you find the gem. You dig a little bit, and then you find the true meaning of life. In Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, it said, The secret things belong unto the Lord. Our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. The secret things belong to God, but He wasn't hiding them from us, He was hiding them for us. The only way we find them is when we dig, when we search, when we pursue after Him. The ability to please God is a function of your belief in His identity. It's a function of your belief in his sovereignty, in his deity. And when you do that, when you have a knowledge of him, suddenly you begin to experience the wonders of God. Suddenly you begin to see the goodness of God. Suddenly everywhere you go, the presence of God fills the place. Suddenly, before you ask, it is provided. Before you speak, it is it is it materializes. Because Hebrews eleven six tells us, without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is. Come on. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. It starts with you believing, knowing in your heart of her that God is who he is. He's who he said he is. He's sweet. He can do what he said he can do. He's got what he said he's got. He has your, your biggest desire in his heart. Until you, you settle that knowledge of his person. You can pray till you blew in the face. You can fast till you, are, you become a skeleton. You will still not see the fullness of his provision. But when you know him for who he is, when the knowledge of God fills your heart, you don't need to ask anything. 
the book of Hosea, chapter 6, from verse 1 to verse 3. He said, come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath turned, and he will heal us. He has smitten, and he will bind us up. And after two days, he will raise us up. He will raise us. In the third day, he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, He's going forth, he's prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain unto the earth. It, it, it doesn't matter what you've been through. It does, it has no, it, I'm not commonizing, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying what you've been through, what you're experiencing is. No, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm talking about when you compare that to his love, his provision, his kindness, his willingness, his everything for you. Ah, oh, come on. Come on. Come on. Hosea chapter 6, verse 6 says, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. The knowledge of God more than birth offering. The question is, do you actually know God or do you just know about him? Do you know about him or do you know him? Proverbs chapter 11, verse 18. He said, I love them that love me and those that seek me early shall find me. This is God saying, I'm not trying to play hide and seek. No, that's not the game. I'm just saying, I'm always here. I'm always ready. I'm always available. All you have got to do, Sunday, is to just make up your mind to find me. In Jeremiah 29, verse 13, I said, and you shall, you shall seek me and find me where you shall search for me with all of your heart. When you search for him with all of your heart, and you don't need to travel to Jerusalem and you go to, to Timbuktu and travel to Hong Kong and stop out to Australia. No. You want to find him? He's in his work. The issue is that many of us, we seek God. We seek God for what he can do for us rather than seeking him to know who he is. Now, there is nothing wrong with seeking God for his provision, for his protection, for his promises. There's nothing wrong with all of that. But there's a better way to, to get those things than making them the focus of your attention, the purpose of your seeking God. There's a better way because in, in the gospel of John chapter 15, verse seven, he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. The reason for that is simple. When you abide in him, the only way to abide in him is to seek him, to find him and stay with him. To abide means to live in, in a place, to remain connected, to habitat in a place, to take residence in it. It's not like you visiting every Sunday or you here today, gone tomorrow, like it's a it, it, uh, Airbnb hotel. That you, no, no, it's saying when you find me, when your heart is knitted, is connected, is bolted, is screwed up to mine, when there is no difference between you, when what you want is what I want, when what I desire is your heart desire, you don't need to ask me anything because before you ask, it's already there. No wonder Psalm 91 verse 1 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Where is your dwelling place today? Where are you dwelling right now? Because in order to know someone, even in the natural, you must invest time. You must invest energy. You must invest resources. You must spend time in, in getting closer to that person and remain, remaining connected to that person. That's how you will get to know the person.
Do you know him? Or do you just know about him? Second Peter chapter, chapter one. Second Peter chapter one from verse two to verse four. It says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of our Jesus, and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power had given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by this ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through loss. Do you want peace? Do you want grace? If you want all things that pertain to life and godliness. If your desire is to have exceeding grace and precious promises, if you want to be a partaker of his divine nature, if you want to escape the corruption that is in this world, if you want to have grace and his peace and his joy and his glory and his power, just get more knowledge of him. Deepen your knowledge of him. Get to know him. Find out about him, search for him, dig for him, look for him. Now the question is, how do I do that? How do I get to know him? How do I search for him? How do I, how do I get more knowledge of who God is? The first step towards knowing God is to believe that he is who he said he is. Don't believe what anybody is telling you. No, you get to know him by you believing that. What he said he is, who he said he is, how he said he is, that's who he is. Remember the story of Moses when God said, go back to Egypt and rescue the children of Israel. And Moses was stripping and he said, he was trying to find a way to wriggle out. And then he said to God, even when I go and I say to these people, and then they ask me, who is this God that you're talking about? What should I, how should I tell them? Who should I tell them sent me? God said, that's the problem. In Exodus chapter three from verse 13, to, 13 to 14. And Moses said unto God, behold, when I came unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, the God of your father had sent me unto you and they shall say unto me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. Who is God to you today? Who is your God to you today? Because the degree of your knowledge will determine the level of your trust in him, in his attributes, in his promises, in his covenant, in his provision, in his protection. Your knowledge of God must start with the acknowledgement of his existence. Your knowledge of God must start with you knowing that he, he's, he, he exists. Not all this idea of, oh, yeah, you know, the man upstairs, you know, the old grand duke up there, you know, if there's somebody up there. No. You must know that he is alive. He exists. Oh, well, but I can't see him. Thank God you can't see him because if you can see him, then he won't be God. But just because you can't see him does not take away from the, from the truth, not even the fact, the truth that he exists. Have you seen your heart before? How do you know you have one? You just know it's there. You just know it's there. Your knowledge must start with the acknowledgement of his existence of his deity, of his sovereignty, of his power, of his majesty, of his glory. You need, you must 
have this without a shadow of a doubt in your heart. Not because somebody said, not because, no, you know that for yourself. There must be a revelatory knowledge of that that is personal to you. Because unless it is personal to you, somebody with sweet lips and sweet words and an orator will come from somewhere and talk you out of it. But when it is your revelatory knowledge, when it has become your personal identity, they can talk to the blue in the face. It don't change who you are. The potency of your faith is directly connected to your trust, not only in God's word, but in who he is. Because he gave the word. We're going to do a series on faith at some point. And it's going to, it's going to shake a lot of things that as Christians, especially Pentecostal Christians, a lot of things that we begin with, we believed and 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 put our, our hope and our trust and our faith in. When we start to open up what faith is and how faith is, some of us are going to go back to some pastors and say, "I, I, I want my time back because you you stole my time." The potency of your faith. And remember, without faith, you can't please God. Without faith, you can't receive anything. The potency of your faith is directly connected to your trust, not only in God's word, but in God, in himself. But you cannot trust him if you don't know him. You cannot know him if you don't seek for him and find him. You cannot know him if you don't spend time with him. And the Bible tells us that just shall live by faith. If we're to live by faith, and this faith is subject, is a function of our knowledge of him. I think knowing him becomes very important. The second way of knowing God is by spending time with him. Spend time with him. Well, you know, the, he's in heaven, and I'm here in uh, in England, so you can see the distance. And I'm not uh, Richard Branson or Jess Bezos who can just get on a rocket and fly out of Earth and hopefully one day meet with God. No, you can spend time with God because he's made himself available in his words. You can spend time, spend time in the word of God. You will find it. It's amazing some of the things you will find, excuse me, on the pages of the Bible. It will shake you up. It will shape you up. It will give, it will open your eyes. That all the ignorance of 20 years, just like that, will, will just disappear. Spend time in his word. Pray, share him, talk about him. Yeah. The more you spend time with somebody, the more you get to know the person. The more you spend time with somebody, the more you get to know the person. The more you know the person, the more the deeper your connection will go or the, the wider your separation from there will go. But the more you spend time with God, you will not just know him. His attributes, his characters, his way of being, his, his essence will start to rub off on you. The Jews, they looked at the apostles and they said, this, this was the being with Jesus Christ. How? How did they know? Because the, the apostles have spent time with him and his essence his character, his attributes is rubbing off on them. So much so they looked at them and they said, oh, oh this, this, this is one of them. Read the word, study the word, 
Sing the word, meditate on it, pray the word, speak the word, keep the word in front of your heart, in front of your eye gate, your ear gate, your mouth gate. Let the word be with you all the time. Like Apostle, 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 Apostle Peter said, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, he said, we have also a more sure word of prophecy where unto you do, you do well that you take heed as a, unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arises in your heart. We have a more sure word of prophecy. He heard the audible voice of God. He saw Jesus Christ transfigured right before his eyes. He saw Elijah and uh, Moses, and, and it, it's just like, God, let's stay here on this mountain. Let's just camp here. Forget about those nine rascals at the bottom. Let the, Jesus, who built three, three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. I'll be in front of your tent. Peter will be in front of uh, Moses, and John will be in front of the other one. Let's all just stay here. But even while he experienced that inexplicable transformation, transfiguration rather, he's still holding high this word of God. He said, we have something more sure, more concrete than all of that. And it is this word of God. It is important for you to identify how God talks to you and how he, how he leads you. Yeah. And anything God would say to you will be within the confinement of his word. But if you don't know his word, if you haven't spent time in his word, even when he's talking, it's like you're speaking Chinese to an Ijevuma. He just doesn't comprehend. But when you have spent time, You've learned, you've understood, you've, you've um, imbibed him and his presence and, and he, the way he talks. And you, you have, your ears have been tuned to the frequency of God. When he talks, you pick it up just like that. As we close. The third way of knowing God is by inviting him into your life. The Bible said, we have all come short. We have sinned and we've been separated from God. We have come short of his glory, of his standard, of his expectation. We have been separated from God by sin since the fall of, of man in the garden. How would you know him if you are far from him? How would you get to know him if you are separated from him? How would you get to know him if you are not close to him? Well, there is a way. He made a way. He built a bridge. He, he, he paid for the construction of the road that leads back to God, which is life and his blood. So the third way of knowing God is by inviting him into your life. He's a gentle God. Oh, God is so gentle. He won't force himself on you. If God is like you and I, with all the power that he has, with all the, the, energy, the, the resources at his disposal, with one flick of a finger, the whole world will become born again. Because more than anything, that's what God wants. But he said he won't force himself on you. He will not force himself on you. He has given you a nice something called free will. And he respects that. He is bound by his word. No, he will knock the door down just to come and save you. Because Revelation chapter 3, Revelation 3 verse 20 tells us, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. This is the same Jesus Christ 
when he resurrected, walked through the wall, just appear in the in the room where his disciples were with the door locked, just nothing could hold him back. And now he's confined himself to the point of saying, I'm knocking at the door of your heart. If you hear my knock and you open the door, I will come in. I will stop with you. But if you harden your heart, I'll just move on to the next person. Do you know him today? Have you ever established a connection with him? Have you ever asked God to take charge of your life again? Have you ever behold and just receive the precious gift of his righteousness? Or are you still so bogged down with, I'm doing it my way? Where are you today in your connection with God? Because he's knocking right now. He's knocking right now. He's knocking on your heart right now. He's, he's, he's calling your name right now. Will you let him in? Will you open the door of your heart? Will you accept him? Will you welcome him into your life? Well, I, don't, I don't like strangers. I don't want strangers. And people that don't, really? Father Abraham entertain strangers, and they gave him a promise that by this time next year, as the Lord leaves, Jesus is knocking at your door, the door of your heart right now. He's calling your name. He's seeking you. He's, he's, he's presenting himself, himself to you. So see, would, you just, would, you, would you just open your eyes? God loves you, and he has a great plan for you, better than any plan that this world could offer you. But he won't force it on you. He won't force himself on you. You have to be willing. You have to be ready. You have to be committed. You have to, to be hungry for him, for his knowledge, that you, you ask him to come into your life. Because that's the best and the biggest decision any human being can make. So if you are in this service today, as we close, if you are in this service today, wherever you are watching, and you don't have this relationship with God, or you are in this service today, you have this relationship with God, but tradition, religion, church, and pastors have made you to start to question to the point where you even want to walk away because what they promise is not what you are seeing. It's because you have put your trust in man, not in God. When you get to know him for yourself, no man can deceive you about who he is. So if you have become dis 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 disinterested, in God, if you have walked away from your fellowship with God, he's still knocking too. He said, come on. Don't, don't, be, don't let what they said, what they've told you, what they've done to you, how they've portrayed me, don't let that stop you from tasting to see that truly the God, that God is good. Experience God for yourself. Maybe for the first time. Because right now, right now, at this very minute, he is knocking on your heart. Will you open the door? If you are ready to open that door and let him into your life, if you are, if you are not at the point where you've heard that knock, the spirit of God in you has suddenly kick-started your heart of flesh and, and turn that heart of stone into heart of flesh. If that is you, all I ask 
All I require, all I am begging you for is to say a simple word of prayer with me. Because that is the way to get to start this relationship with him. So if you are in this service today, or you are watching this program anytime, anywhere, any day, and you want to, you are ready, just say this word with me, this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you today, just as I am. I've heard a lot about you. I don't know you. I have no relationship with you. But from what I've heard this morning, I think I'm ready. I want you to come into my life. I know I've walked away, I've done my own things, I've lived in sin and all of that. But I ask for your forgiveness. Please forgive me. I understand, I've been told that your blood washes away every sin and every guilt and every shame. Wash me with that blood today. Cleanse me from my head to my toe. Deliver me from myself. Come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. Take charge of my life from this day forward. I know you have heard me. I believe you have received me. And I know that you are in my life right now. And I thank you because now I know that I'm born again. Now I know that I have received the gift of the righteousness. Now I know that my eternity is secured with God. Now I know that my name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. And I give you all the glory for it. In Jesus' precious name, amen.